sure you love Jesus. I'm sure I love Jesus. Then why do you love Jesus? Just why I love Jesus. Because he first loves me. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. That was the sermon. <laughs> so it'll be very short. Yeah, basically, basically, they stole my thunder if I had any. <laughs> that was fantastic. Really good. Very, very good. Very impressed with that. Very impressed. The most important question. Life is full of questions. People question you. What do you believe and why do you believe? And they always expect an answer of some kind. And it's not always easy to come up with an answer, particularly one that is truthful or makes sense. But we're going to deal with what I would consider to be the most important question. It's not necessarily this question. But the question that is most important to many people is this. Do you love me? Boy, isn't that a frequently asked question? There are only really two possibilities. You've got to tick one of those boxes. Then sometimes you see a third one that says, maybe. You saw the same stuff, maybe. There's no such thing as maybe in loving another person, a particular person, in a very special way. There is... There is it is either yes or no. I go as far as to say it either is all or nothing. Love is one of those things. When we think of love, the word love, uh, we think of an emotional state. I mean uh, emotions, clearly. It's a feeling. Love is a feeling, that's for sure. Um, there is no love without feeling. But love, true love, is a principle. We have the unenviable task as Christians to love those we don't like. Ever tried that? I will talk more about that. I think that is important. We can all love the people we like. I can do that too. It's easy. 
But to be able to love the people you don't like. The people you disagree with. Yeah. The people that have a different opinion. Vote for a, another political party, the one you don't like. Hmm. Plenty of ammunition there. Plenty, plenty, plenty. Now, here is the next question. Do you love me, darling? Yes, dear. How much? <laughs> well, how much is much? And if you can get out of that one, or past that one, why do you love me? <laughs> because he first loved me. <laughs> the answer is there. <laughs> they gave the answer. Anyway. But there it is. There it is. At uh, breakfast at the beach. It's after his resurrection. And uh, they've decided they go back to Galilee, the disciples, to do some fishing. Uh, there's very, very little known about the 40 days that Jesus actually spent here between his resurrection and him going back to heaven. It's very early in the morning and they've been fishing and they have not been doing well. It's been a disaster of a night. And then there's a stranger on the shore in the early morning light. They, they, they hear the voice of a stranger and the stranger says, do you have anything to eat? In other words, did you catch anything? And they indicated, no, we didn't catch anything. And then John, the writer of the gospel that records it, says to Peter, it's the Lord. So Peter takes off his overcoat, he jumps straight in and he comes to the beach. And then he finds already a breakfast cooking. Amazing, really. And they're eating, all of them, but there's not much being said. There he is, He's, he was crucified, dead. Yes, they've seen him that night, true. Here he is again. How does he do it? Questions. And there's an issue with Peter. Peter had made a terrible mistake. Peter had done what? Denied. He denied his Lord. And everybody knew it. Everybody knew it. And Peter would have been feeling terrible about this. And then the silence is broken and Jesus looks at Peter and he says, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Feed my, my, my lamb. And then a little while later, the same question, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I, I, you know, yes. Tend my sheep. And then one final time, one for each time of the denial, Jesus says, Peter, do you really love me? And he gets terribly upset. Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. He was now qualified to work for Jesus. What is the qualification? You've got to love him. If you don't love Jesus, here is a thing that you need to understand. If you don't love Jesus, I go as far as to say you may well limit the love that you have for others. If you don't love him, you are the poorer for it. So how do you love him? I want to talk about that a bit today this afternoon and so <clears throat> Peter is restored fully qualified now to be working for Jesus the new church wonderful and so he becomes a tremendous apostle that word for love in the Hebrew is a very interesting language now you read from right to left and I, that still doesn't help you I know that that ohev is when you love something Oh, have. A half is to love. Okay. It's a composite word. Now, 
whilst I know that in the Gospel of John that comes to us in the Greek, and you have Agape and Filio, the, the, the difference is there, and it's, it's an interesting mind play when Jesus uses two different words for the three questions. But uh, they would have spoken Aramaic. Aramaic is very close to the Hebrew. Same grammar, pretty well. It means to love. But as I said, it is a composite word and there is a huge principle behind it. When you look at that word, that is the, the last two, because you can go from right to left, half means give. There are other words in the Hebrew, Natan, there's a few others, but this is the verb you would use a great deal, half, is meaning give. If you put that little word here, it's called an aleph. Aleph is the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, or aleph bet, as they would say it. This aleph is a conjugation of a verb which brings you into the first person. Have a look at that. That's, the, that's give, and that means I give. Do you understand where we're going here? You see, I give, and that means love. Same root words, they are related. You can't love without giving. And that may well be the difference between lust and love. Or infatuation and love. When you love, you give. And it is I give. You understand where we're going? Very important principle. Let's, let's dwell on that. So when Jesus said to Peter, do you love me more than these? There is the thought pattern, do you truly love me and do you give me more than these? You understand? The, both principles are here. What he's saying to Peter, will you give me? Give me what? Well, of course, your love, your loyalty, your time, your life. That is what it really means. That is the giving, <clears throat> is the loving. Now, for some reason, Jesus said this. Having, having a regard of what I just explained to you. If you love me... <clears throat> You, yeah, that's correct. You'll keep my commandments. And why is that not working so much for us so often? But if you love me, he says, if you give me, you have to give him whatever it is you need to give and then keep the commandments, you see. You understand? There's a lot more to it. For all have sinned, fallen short of the glory of God. What's another word for glory? That's not the word I was looking for. Character. Character. Make it character. So there is a, we have fallen short of the character of God. God is perfect. The Bible also says the epistle of one of the epistles of John, God is love. So God is a giver. The first thing you should know about God is <clears throat> that he is a giver. If God was not a giver, and I'm just going to wonder a little bit without breaking the boundaries. There is God. Why did he have to create this world? I'll come to that in a minute. But we do know he wants to give. Now let's, let's talk about giving a little bit more. A most important truth. 
Loving is giving. And giving is loving. Unless you give someone a black eye. That's not what I'm talking about. The actual process of giving, please follow me here, develops the very connection between the giver and the receiver. Without giving, there is not going to be a giver or a receiver. There is not going to be any relationship. It is impossible to have a relationship and exempt it from giving or receiving. Agreed? So the actual process of receiving does the same thing. Yeah? That is what develops the very connection between the giver and the receiver. The greater the giving, guess what? The greater the connection. The greater the receiving, the greater the connection. Now, have you ever known people, and don't start mentioning names, so, that only take, they only receive? Yeah? I hope it's in the past. It's very tiring, isn't it? A relationship doesn't stand a chance like that. In fact, there should be both giving and receiving from both sides in order to have a relationship. Can you identify with that? That's a necessity. If it's one-way traffic, it's not going to last. So we're looking for a two-way relationship based on love. Because what's the summary? What is the summary of the Ten Commandments? Well, the first one, the first four pertaining to your relationship with God, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul. That's it. And then your neighbor as yourself. Why? Well, your neighbor is, is the property of God. If you love God, you love his property. Can you see, if that's not right, you struggle with this one. You become very selective. You only, you only love those whom you like and whom you agree with. That's not the principle of love. Because you don't give and you don't receive. No love. So, so giving and receiving from both sides, that is what creates and establishes and upholds the relationship. The greatest giving is at cost to ourselves. Particularly if it's understood that it is at cost of ourselves. Um, to suffer loss. When you give to the point where you suffer loss, you are expressing love. Because love has the principle of giving. Not just receiving. It's in the giving. More than anything else. And if it's appreciated and recognized that this giving is at cost of you to you to suffer loss, it becomes, it ought to become very valuable in the sight of the receiver and it should bring forth a gratitude. Is that fair enough? That's fair enough. This giving creates and sustains love. You can take it one step further. The greatest giving is the giving of oneself. There is a giving that is beyond the material by far, even beyond the, the, the principle of time slots. It really means it becomes a part of you. Um, <clears throat> you ever, I was going to say that it'll drain you, but that's not quite how it is. It really takes, it, it makes you, you know, true love. When you really love, you become vulnerable because you open up, don't you? You then trust and you become vulnerable. There's a risk in loving. Ask God, he knows all about it. There is a risk in loving. The greatest giving is really the giving oneself. 
not just of you, from you, but actually yourself. That's the highest form of giving. The greatest giving is more than helping. It is in the establishment of the relationship. You now have a relationship. If it's recognized, if it's understood, if it is appreciated, if it brings forth gratitude, you can have a rock-solid relationship. Yeah? So far all good? All right. I like this one. Love me when I least deserve it. You know why? Because that is when I most need it. How often haven't we done wrong? And you know the conviction comes. And the greatest need you have is that tea or is that water? Water. Oh, water. Two. Two. Did I give the impression that I was thirsty? But I thank you for it. Oh, yes. That's giving. <laughs> okay. All right. When you have put a distance between you and God because you know you've done wrong, once the fun of the sin is over, you miss the company of God, the closeness. And more than anything else, you are in need of his love. Yeah? It's true. It's true. Oscar Hammerstein, he was an American, uh, American uh, music director for 40 years. If you're in the music, you know his name. I love, I love this statement. This is very good. This applies to every Christian in a sense. Do you love me because I am beautiful? Or am I beautiful because you love me? I love that. There's a lot in that. The beauty about you and me is because we're loved by God. The intrinsic value on you, indisputably, is the love of God. You can't buy it, achieve it. You can only receive it. Yeah? You can only receive it. Very important principle. The most important untruth... Satan, of course, is the father of all lies, yeah? Jesus called him the father of lies. He didn't call him the father of greed. He didn't call him the father of lust. He says he is the father of lies. He's a liar. If you don't know what that means, watch the American elections. <laughs> As they point to each other. Yes. You can't fulfill God's calling. That's a lie. When God calls you, he enables you. You will never have what it takes. That's a lie too. When you connect with Christ, everything is possible. He'll say, you are a terrible person. Not in the eyes of God. You may have done a terrible thing. You're not a terrible person. You are too sinful to be saved. That's a blatant lie. It's blatant because God forgives. You are what you do. That's not true either. Not really. Good people, decent people, sometimes do some terrible things. And you can look back and you say, did I do that? Yes, you did. And you get quite disgusted with yourself and disappointed. Don't worry. We're all in the same boat. We're human. Fallible. But we never be on salvation. And we are not, we are not what we do. We are the sons and the daughters of the king of the universe. 
He created us and he bought us back. So it's a lie. Our identity was settled at the cross. And Satan knows that. But that doesn't stop him from trying. Creation of the world. I want you to think with me. The main agent in the creation of this world was the second member of the Godhead, whom we know as Jesus Christ. But we're only talking about a tiny little world. It's only a speck in the cosmic reality of the Milky Way, the galaxy. We know that there are billions of galaxies. Now your mind is off. Can you comprehend? No, I can't. Listen to this, listen to this. There is no end on the universe. Even if you came to the very end of the universe, you came to the back door, what is behind the back door? Eternity. Eternity is the absence of a beginning. It's that simple. So when you have an eternity, it can only pertain to God. Now, in Micah, the announcement of the Messiah to come, and you might like to check this, it's wonderful, <clears throat> is not just the one who came from ancient days, Mikadem, he says, Micah says, Me'olam, he comes from eternity. Therefore, he is eternity. So an eternal God becomes man. You know that story. But do you really know the story? I know it, I've preached on it, and I, 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 I have thought on it, but I still recognize. I, I absol- the more I study, the more I give it thought, the more I know how little I know. Makes me very humble. So the creator of a universe, the creator of innumerable galaxies, suns, planets, this planet, invades his creation and becomes a part of it because he becomes a part of a great controversy about his character. Marvelous. You know what <coughs> is marvelous? We live in a fallen world with sin. Sin is an intruder. The foreknowledge of God had it that this planet one day will be marred by sin. He knew it. Then why make this planet? Because he allows it to happen. And we could dwell on this at length, God is not afraid of being examined by a universe. When he says he is love, he is. It is the highest order of being. And you can judge him. We want to run those series. You can look at God. But you can never deny that God is love. Even though we may have difficulty understanding the sin issue. Sin encroaches. It's an intruder, but sin is temporary. Sin is not here to say. Sin is not part of God's creation. It's going to be done away with. And we are in a very unique position here. The greatest choice... I, I like this sort of artist impression... It's nothing what it would have looked like. But can you imagine, after the expelling of Lucifer and one third of the angels, billions of angels, he's outside. And God creates this planet. And as he creates this planet, there is a test tree. And the two members of the human race are on probation. 
They have eternal life. But it's dependent upon obedience. They forewarned everything. And they fail. They fall. Sin comes into the world. And then there is an announcement in heaven, like there was on this planet, Genesis 3.15. There is an announcement in heaven that God has a plan so that the human race might be saved. And he conveys that to the heavenly beings. And it becomes clear that the only one who can do this has to be God himself. There was a covenant between man and God. Man broke it. God does the repair. He's the only one. He is the only one. And he does. That plan, as that we know as the plan of salvation, was in place before he created this world. It was not an afterthought. It was there, in place. Magnificent, really. And I like to stand still for a moment. Yet it was the struggle even with the king of the universe to yield up his son to die for the guilty race. I get that from a book called Patriarchs and Prophet. I totally recommend it to you. God had an enormous... Sometimes we think of God and as if God is aloof over there uh, with, with just a very limited emotional feeling. No, nothing could be more wrong. Nothing could be more wrong. And so, and so he struggles, he struggles because there is something that he has to give. In fact, he has to give himself. Get it? He has to give himself. No greater gift. No greater gift to the Father, no greater gift to the Son who who, who voluntary, voluntary goes ahead. I I still find it amazing. And so so he struggles because in in John 3.16 there is this text which you all know. But God so loved the world, this God the Father, that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now try to get your mind around that. He gave him. And when he came here, when he was human, he took his his humanity with him to heaven. The second member of the Godhead retained his humanity. Because in his humanity, he gave the greatest expression of the deepest and the most profound love that any living entity could have for another. That's how it is. I, I, when I read that, I thought again of how difficult decisions sometimes can be. I, I saw a movie. This is 1982, I think it was. The greatest choice is not the title. The greatest choice is Sophie's Choice. Has anybody ever seen it in 1982? I was very impressed with that. Very impressed. This young mother with two young children ends up in, uh, obviously, concentration camp. It's during the Holocaust. And, And as they are all huddled in the various directions, there is an issue here. She's got two young children. And one of the guards, one of the guards takes the satanic delight to put it to the mother. You can choose one child. That child will be adopted uh, out. And the other one will go to the gas chamber. And there's just a little clip here. Don't make me make this choice because I can't. How cruel can you be? How cruel can you be? She survived. But the guilt of choosing the son and letting the little girl go to the gas chamber. If she didn't choose, she was told they both go to the gas chamber. What do you do? How difficult that is, isn't it? Terrible. 
terrible thing that people can find uh, to do against one and another. She has no success for her relationship, and ultimately the guilt gets the better of her, and there is a suicide. What a tragedy. How difficult it can be to make a choice. And sometimes I wonder how difficult it was, as, as the author said there, how difficult it must have been for God the Father to make that choice. But he did make the choice. He came to this sin-darkened world. He came to reveal the light of God's love to be God with us. God with us. The one who came was the same person as God. There was an empty place there and he comes here in the form of fallen humanity. Incredible. Immanuel. Immanu with us, El, the singular for Elohim. With us, God. <clears throat> Fantastic. Our little planet, our little world is the lesson book of the universe. Did you know that? We are the only spot in the universe where it went wrong. The only one. Where sin found a successful intrusion. It's the only one. It's the only one. And now the whole of the universe is looking into what is happening here on this planet. And by the way, by the way, every single one of you here is a participant in that controversy. Now people might say, oh, I don't want that. I don't buy that. It's not for me. Too bad. You're here. Tough luck. You can say no to God. Not a clever thing to do. And I wonder as a child. So he's a child. This, this is almost unbelievable. Uh, he passed by the homes of wealth, the courts of royalty, uh, the renowned seats of learning. He goes to this obscure, despised Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? It was that kind of a place. Well, he did. Marvelous. That is the same person that puts the galaxies there. Try to get your mind around that. It's the same person who as God is the life giver. Same one. Same one. His mother was his first human teacher. From her lips and from the scrolls of the prophets, the Bible, the Bible, he learned of heavenly things. He had the mind of a child that was developing. You understand? He had no advantage in that regard over us. He had to learn things. Walk, play, do sanitation, everything. Marvelous. He had to learn. But what is incredible, uh, the very words which he himself spoke to Moses for the benefit of Israel. He had to learn. What did I say? Do you understand what I'm saying? Do you know what I'm saying? What, what, he is, what he had to learn, what he had to own in his mind is the very words that he as God spoke. That's very big. That's enormous. He was now taught at his mother's knee. That is a humbling out of proportion. The child grew, waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom. He had a beautiful disposition. Beautiful. And the grace of God was upon him. Jesus increased in wisdom and stature in favor with God and man. As a child, Jesus manifested a peculiar loveliness of disposition. How many kids can you say that about? Yeah? Have kids? No, you will. His willing hands were ever ready to serve others. He manifested a patience that nothing could disturb. He lived to bless others. When we talk about Jesus, we think of him as the Messiah for the three and a half years. No, think of him as a child. Think of him as a teenager. 
Think of him as one that is becoming an adolescent. Think of one that has become mature and there he is. He is there working away. One of the most humblest of professions. But he's doing it and he's doing it well. And that is God. Unbelievable. But that is how it is. Satan was unwearied in his efforts to overcome the child of Nazareth. From his earliest years, Jesus was guarded by heavenly angels. He was protected by angels. No harm could come to him unless he departed from the will of his father. But he never did. He never did. Now you say, that's wonderful. He had this wonderful relationship with his father through the agency perhaps of the Holy Spirit. Uh, You know, wonderful. He was at an advantage. No. The problem was he was holy in here and what he did. Can you imagine how he might have stood out, particularly there in the community of Nazareth? He could have sinned. Oh, easy. But he didn't. He chose not to. Now, this is fantastic. Something drove him. You know what drove him was that relationship with his father. He had that relationship What is love again? A half means give, I give. He gave back to his father. What did he give back to his father? He gave back to his father every bit of obedience that he could produce. Every bit. All of his time, all of his being. He did. And so, that there should be upon the earth... One life free from defilement of sin. Satan hated that. Book of Job. Do you know Job? Yes. He hated him. Satan hated Job. He was upright, blameless, righteous, shun evil. Satan hates that. Be good and be hated by Satan. True. This really was an offense and a perplexity to the prince of darkness, the enemy of souls. That's what it was. Now, he lived in a peasant's home. Very humble. Faithfully and cheerfully acted his part in bearing the burdens of the household. He was a great kid. One that you'd like to have in the house. You could give him the chores and he would do them. How are you going with your kids? Nothing was too much for him. He had been the commander of heaven. Billions of angels under his command. Gets involved in house chores. And angels had delighted to fulfill his words. And there he was being told to empty the garbage, clean up the rubbish, carry this, carry that, get the water, whatever, 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 whatever. And he does it because he is a God who gives. Only a God who is love, I have. Only a God who is a giver can do that. Now he was a willing servant, a loving, obedient son. He learned the trade with his own hands, worked in the carpenter shop with Joseph. Carpenter. I love that. Of all the professions that Jesus could have had, all the trades, he was a carpenter. Why was he a carpenter? Oh, I always love it when somebody remembers wood in the Bible, organic and perishable, stands for humanity. A carpenter works with humanity. Jesus still is a carpenter up there. When they when he became one with the human race, 
was best expressed in the crucifixion. A cross is made of what? Wood. Wood is? You can't get closer or be more one with humanity than to be nailed to the cross. Can you see that? Just a thought. In the carpenter shop with Joseph, Jesus was the fountain of healing mercy for the world and through all those secluded years at Nazareth, his life flowed out in currents of sympathy and tenderness. You know, regardless of how good he was, how wonderful he was, the fact that he was, that he came here, that he came of the infinite height of deity and became the most humble of human beings. It's marvelous. Only a God who gives can do that. The greatest gift is love. And there it was, it culminated, gravitated towards Calvary. Now, I'm not going to speak on Calvary, but what happened there is un- indescribable. When they nailed him to the cross, they nailed their creator to the cross. When they nailed their creator to the cross, it was the one that put in place everything. Everything, everything. I mean, everything that is matter, every molecule, every atom came from him. It has no other origin. He is the first cause of everything there is. And everything there is, is energy. Energy is matter. Matter is energy. Einstein. Energy has to have a first cause. They nailed the first cause to the cross. What must a universe have thought? What are they doing? They must have stood in absolute amazement. And that the father did not interfere. It's big, isn't it? It's really very big. It's very, God's wonderful purpose of grace, the mystery of redeeming love, is the theme in towards angels. Desire to look. Half, more than half of humanity can't be bothered to even think about it. Angels love to look into this. The plan of salvation. And it will be their study throughout endless ages. Both the redeemed and the unfallen beings will find in the cross of Christ their science and their song. And of course that comes again from desire of ages. Let me assure you, if you get to know him now, receive from him now and give to him now. You have a wonderful future, an incredible future, beyond your wildest imaginations. I may not be perfect, neither are you. That doesn't help, does it? I may not be perfect, but Jesus thinks I am worth dying for. And he thinks the same of you. You understand? That's the value he put on you. I love this statement again from her, the writings. It's just perfectly worded, so it's copied there verse by verse. Christ was treated as we deserve, that we might be treated as he deserves. He was condemned for our sins, in which he had no share, he was sinless that we might be justified by his righteousness, not ours, his righteousness in which we had no share. Love the language. He suffered the death which was ours. That's what he did. That we might receive the life which was his. I don't know any more beautiful words than that because every word of it is absolutely true. And so, 10 things God wants you to remember. I hope you have a good memory. Let's go through them. 
God says, I will give you rest. I will strengthen you. I will answer you. I believe in you. I will bless you. I am for you. I will not fail you. I will provide for you. I will be with you and I love you. It's beautiful, isn't it? So nice to have his presence in your life. It helps you to arise above the annoyances of life. It puts in proportion what you're going through, and it could be really something severe. But when there is this guarantee coming from the throne of God, you are wealthy, you are rich, you are saved. And so, if God could complain... Maybe he would put it this way. You hurt me more than what I deserve. You ever, we always think on how much we suffer. How often do we think of how much God suffers? You know why he might say that? You hurt me more than what I deserve because I loved you more than what you deserved. Does that make sense? It's true. I love the Apostle Paul. I am persuaded, he said, that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God. He said, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Did you know that? Nothing can, because it's all in Christ Jesus our Lord. The only one who can put himself outside the love of God is you. It's your choice. It's you. You can ignore him. You, you can put him on the shelf. You can visit him once a week. You, you allow him to, to have a certain portion of your life as time-wise, resources-wise, thought-wise. Won't work. What is love again? Give. If you want to be saved, you have to do what he did. You got to give yourself. That's it. That's what you've got to do. Hudson Taylor said this. You know, people sometimes think things are so impossible, impossible, impossible. There are three stages in the work of God, and you're all a piece of work from God, for God. There are three stages in the work of God. The impossible, the difficult, done. You like that? Love it. You'll be amazed. You'll be amazed. So, coming to the conclusion for this afternoon, I never go over time much. The most important question, if I asked you what in your mind, having listened, and you have, there's a few that sort of, you know, but the rest was good. If you had a question and considered it to be the most important question, what would it be? What would it be? You're all silent. It's okay. What would be the most important question? This is, in my understanding, the most important question. God will ask you this question. Did you really believe that I loved you? Do you understand? Because if you believe that he really loves you, it'll show. And you love him because as the two artists performed here, I love him because he loved me first. That's the message. They stole it. But it is the message. If your life reflects 
the affirmative to the question. You would have had, by the time you appeared before God, if there was an account to be given, you would have had a wonderful, not an easy, but a wonderful life. Because ultimately, folks, we want to live with the one who loves us most. What is home? Where you're being loved. Therefore, please let it be in the affirmative. We have a special item. Again, how come you get out of it so light? Messiah would come, the earth would rejoice, the people start to sing. For they would be whole, as scriptures foretold, a mighty king of kings. But he came as a child. Like they had planned, not like they planned. Lion of Judah, Lamb of God, glorious Conqueror, 
suffering son, Lion of Judah, with nails in his hands, the mighty Redeemer was me. Thank you, Tim and Charlotte, and the two kids, for sharing your wonderful talents. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you, Stan. That was magnificent again. Folks, shall we bow our heads? Heavenly Father, we, we've learned a lot this afternoon. We learned that you are all a God who gives so much including yourself. Lord, help us to be grateful for what you have given us, life itself, an eternity that awaits us if only we accept. Thank you for being who you are. What a wonderful, wonderful thing it will be when we see each other face to face. The wonderful thought that one day one day in this new world restored the new world made new again we will walk together I wish it was tomorrow it's wonderful to know that we are so loved help us to really believe that and then live out of that belief every day and every moment of every day. Help us to look at each other as the objects, the subjects of your the subjects of your objects of your love. Then respect them and love them as well. Because they belong to you. We thank you that we belong to you, that you bought us. It's comforting to know that we are truly yours and forevermore and that nothing can change that maybe only ourselves and why would we want to lord thank you for everything now we pray that you stay with us as we have the fellowship we have the food that the food may nourish our bodies and thank you for all those who volunteer to bring this food along and uh, I uh, ask that you also bless the fellowship and Lord that you give us a good week a week where we will come closer to you more and more and then return here for worship and study in Jesus name we pray Amen God bless you have a wonderful week <laughs>